STEM fans, are you ready? Let's hear it for the world-class NASA STEM Stars team. From NASA centers across the country, we present Dr. Aaron Brunstall. Hello and welcome to NASA STEM Stars. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. How does it feel to be a NASA STEM star? Oh, this this is amazing. No, thank thank you so much for having me. This is I always I love gathering and talking about astrobiology and science and things and this is just cool. We're, we're so excited to have you. Um, my name is Lynn Dotson. I am an education specialist and I'm coming to you live from Kennedy Space Center and we're kicking off the first week of Pride Month, and this is our 59th episode of NASA STEM Stars webinar. Joining us today is Dr. Aaron Gronstel from the Astrobiology Program Office at NASA's headquarters, and Aaron will share with you his background, his career, his experiences, and his amazing work he does with NASA. Finally, be sure to stick around because your questions will be answered by our NASA STEM star, and I have a fun call to action at the end. So let's get started. I am so excited to formally introduce again, Aaron Gronstel, AKA astrobiologist by day and superhero comic artist by night. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Aaron, and some of your things that you do, some things that interest you. So uh, yeah, my name's Aaron Gronstel. I, um, I grew up in Iowa. Um, kind of middle, middle of the country, split between two places, um, one place called Carroll, Iowa, and another place called Okaboji. It's on the, the land of the Ocheti Shakoe. And yeah, grew up, grew up there, um, grew up in a place on, on Lake Okaboji, big into swimming and water skiing and eventually wakeboarding once once I got big enough. So a lot of, a lot of lake injuries and a lot of, a lot of time in the water. Um, I went on uh, to study uh, theater and performance studies and molecular environmental biology. So I was kind of split between two tracks and, and professionally and, and eventually settled on science and kind of followed that along and ended up at, at NASA. Very cool, very cool. So obviously a lot of water sports I see. Um, you uh, Theater is, uh, one of my passions too. I know we've talked a little bit about that. So um, it's always exciting um, to know um, someone that also has the same interest as you. Um, so tell us a little bit about, I think we have some pictures about some of your camping, uh, exciting adventures with your your hiking and camping. So tell us a little bit about some of these awesome pictures. Yeah, so I mean, growing up growing up in the lake and, and spending a lot of time outdoors, I've always, always been an avid outdoorsman. And I think with science, it was it was always natural sciences that that really drew me. And um, you know, I did debate for a while of becoming kind of going more into earth science and that sort of thing. But I've I kind of spent a lot of time traveling around and, and camping in places. I think I've I think it's everywhere except except Antarctica so far. But these are some 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 of my favorite places I've been. There's some pictures there from Patagonia and and going up in the glaciers and. Um, up in the Highlands in Scotland. Um, I spent a, a lot of time and did my PhD in the UK and so still spend a lot of time time back in the UK and, and in Glasgow now in particular. And there's a shot of, of wakeboarding on, on Loch Lomond there. Um, and then me, me and my, my home lake in, at Okaboji in Iowa. So kind of the think, almost extreme, extreme sports, but mostly involving ice and also water. So both to, both both phases of water, two of the phases of water. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so your hobbies, your interests, they have, and uh, obviously you're a well-rounded person. You you traveled a lot, but I know that you've gone through some education, uh, and you're we're going to kind of go through your journey. Um, I think the next slide is going to be a slide that's going to talk about where you're from, and then kind of takes us through um, just where how you got where you are today, and especially uh, these adorable pictures of you as a, a child growing up. So talk a little bit about those. So yeah, the first the first picture is, is Okaboji. That's me crawling out of the water, sort of my 
my origin, I guess. <laughs> and um, yeah, I grew, grew up grew up in Iowa. Um, always interested in, in learning and education and things. And I, I, I yeah, I, I enjoyed school. I enjoyed Iowa. I enjoyed like the the community. You know, it was kind of a small town community, which was great. Um, I always knew that I was gonna to leave and travel. Um, and I think growing up growing up gay. Like I needed, I needed to get out and, and see the world, um, particularly at that kind of point in history. Um, and yeah, I got, I mean, my, my educational interests were kind of all over the place. And it was interesting that you said sort of extreme environments for camping, because that's kind of where I ended up with research too, doing, doing research on microbes that live in extreme environments on earth. And um, yeah, yeah and, and that, that probably, that, my, my love of the outdoors and, and traveling and camping and stuff probably influenced that because it was, once I got into scientific research, it was about going to cool field sites and remote locations and that kind of stuff. So that, that probably influenced awesome. that. But yeah, but I had a big interest in, in art and, and theater growing up. My mother is a, a visual artist. Um, my dad's a, a musician who then kind of went into more computer science and stuff, which is an art form of its own. But um, so growing up, I, I got big into theater. I loved theater classes. Um, I also had a fantastic biology teacher in high school and stuff, which really, I think he, he really got me interested in biology and genetics and that sort of thing, which probably influenced my career path quite a bit. Um, and I did a lot, I got involved. So there was this wonderful thing in Iowa growing up when I did where if the school didn't offer a class that a local kind of college or university offered, you could take the college or university class and get reimbursed by the state for it. And so I took a ton of classes at the University of Iowa and Iowa State and Des Moines Area Community College and and things like that through grade school and high school. I, I think the first summer I spent at the University of Iowa was like seventh grade or something like that. And I did um, visual design using, I think it was Adobe Photoshop like 2.0. So very early days of Photoshop um, when I was a kid. And yeah, so I spent, spent a ton of time doing that, always interested in, in education and just learning more and, and taking opportunities. And I think that was, I think one of my kind of big philosophies growing up was if it sounds interesting and I think I'm going to learn something, I'll just say yes. So any opportunity yeah. that came up, I ended up doing, you know, visual design. I did finite mathematics. I did criminology and just all these things. It was like, oh, neat. Like I can, that's, that's something new to learn. And, you know, I think, so I, always, I also think sometimes, yeah, I was, I was, I was always, say you're always, you're always thirsty for knowledge. You sound like the perfect student as a teacher. Um, I would love to have you in my class. I, I was a teacher for a while, but I, I was very uh, taken back by the fact that you said a biology teacher influenced you. So was that junior high, um, high school, was, junior high? Uh, that was high school. I mean, I, I actually okay. had like a pretty great, another wonderful biology teacher. I had actually a number of wonderful biology teachers, but I think it was high school that, like I really got into it and he, he taught ecology and he also got me interested in genetics. And I was taking some um, like biotechnology distance learning classes from Iowa State at the time that he kind of helped me with and, and that sort of thing when I when I got confused by the textbook and that, and that sort of thing. And um, yeah, I don't know if I was a perfect student though. I, I played a lot of pranks on my teachers that <laughs> <laughs> but I That's almost awesome. got well. for. Yeah. yeah, but you know, you got to have a little fun in school. But the, um, yeah. I, in my eyes, as long as you're curious, you're a great student. And that's what I'm trying to instill in my own daughter is like, just be curious, ask questions, keep looking for things. And so actually, we have a question for you uh, that came into the chat that I want to ask you. Um, they're talking, you brought up microbes. So, so one of the questions was from Kristen. Um, she says, hello from Clear Lake, Iowa. Awesome. Oh, wow. And she says, what microbes do you find in extreme environments? So what kind of microbes were you finding from these extreme places? That's a, that's a great question, Kristen. And there's, I mean, there, there are all kinds of mic microbes in extreme environments. And the, I mean, for me specifically, what I worked on was deep, su deep subsurface microbiology. So digging down deep beneath the earth's surface and looking at what lives down there and how it how it's able to survive because we have things that live deep deep underground that can live in you know high pressures high temperatures that sort of thing and it's independent of light from the sun so these are microbes that are able to um, gain energy 
basically through chemical reactions and with different minerals and that sort of thing. So they're really important for NASA in terms of understanding how life can survive in similar environments on, on other planets, um, possibly you know beneath the surface of Mars or, or other rocky planets like that, where the surface might not be habitable for life as we know it. But I mean, one of the big, in my, my PhD work, one of the big questions was, could we find a place underground where microbes didn't exist? And because on Earth, they, they seem to be everywhere. I mean, we find microbes in thermal pools and around thermal vents in the deep ocean, in nuclear reactors, you know, there's, there's all these microbes that have adapted to live in, in just amazing places. So we were looking at an asteroid impact crater that actually didn't form the Chesapeake Bay on the east coast of, of the US, but it sort of influenced how the Chesapeake Bay came to be. And um, what happened was when, it, when, the imp, when the asteroid hit the Earth, it was shallow sea at the time, and it created this big hole and then a bunch of clay and junk washed into it. And we were wondering if once you got to that clay layer um, that kind of capped off the, the stuff that washed into the crater, if that stuff in the crater was sterile or if, or if things had been able to sort of regrow and re-inhabit uh, that, that, wow. that environment. <laughs> that so that is like amazing. The, yeah, I mean, in astrobiology, the big question is when we're looking you know, in the search for life on other planets, you know, we only really have one example of life and that's Earth. So it, life seems really diverse around us and it seems like there's all these different kinds of life, but actually everything on Earth sort of is is one thing. We all, you know, have DNA. We all, it, it's all, it all operates the same way on Earth and we all evolved from kind of, you know, theoretically from sort of one place. So mm -hmm. um, understanding if those, if the, the principles we understand from life on Earth are universal in terms of like, could they be on Mars? Could they be, you know, other other planets around other stars and that sort of thing? Yeah, always that question: Is there life? Other uh, uh, that's that that's always the question we're asking, and it's always fascinating. And I know that this is probably a pretty big uh, topic for some of the our listeners here. That's probably why they tuned in because it's always that question. Um, talk talk a little bit about about how you got where you got here today. So like your journey with education, um, some of the locations I know you have traveled all over. So this slide is a, uh, is a little overwhelming, but uh, give us the, the lowdown of um, your journey because it's been pretty amazing. Okay, well, so I said I started in Iowa. I did a, did a bunch of classes at, at places when I was in Iowa. Um, but when I, when I came time to actually go to university, I, I ended up at UC Berkeley. Um, and I did a Bachelor of Science in Molecular Envir Environmental Biology there, and then a Bachelor of Arts in Theater and Performance Studies. I was, I was an out-of-state student, so I was trying to get as much in as possible for <laughs> get my money's worth, I guess. Um, and then I did spend a year in Australia at the University of Melbourne. Um, I was doing Australian ecology, but I was also kind of understudying with a, a playwright there named Kathleen Mary Fallon, who's just remarkable. Just That was a wonderful experience, and, and I did some Kind of professional theater when I was in Australia and that sort of thing. So that was that was the point where I almost went that way instead of the science route. But um, went back, finished at Berkeley, um, then I ended up going to Strasbourg, France, to the International Space University to do a master's in space science. Um, during that, well, actually, I should go back to when I was at Berkeley. Um, I got involved in a think tank from NASA called To Mars by 2020. So yeah. we were looking at redesigning cooling systems for spacesuits on Mars. And um, through that, I kind of got introduced to NASA Ames. And um, Chris McKay, who's an astrobiologist at NASA Ames, came in and gave a talk uh, to our group. And there was a summer when I was at Berkeley where I just kind of randomly contacted the astrobiology, what was, what was then the astrobiology integration office at, at NASA, uh, at NASA Ames, and ended up kind of going down and and working for them, they, they were really excited to have somebody who was studying science, but also theater. And I was kind of specializing in playwriting. So, you know, the science writing, I kind of got into there and, and worked on communications for them a bit. And I was a, like a visiting scientist at the NASA Institute for Advanced Con Concepts. And so got involved with NASA at NASA Ames um, when I was an undergrad and then sort of started working as a contractor there while I was studying and then while I did my master's and PhD. So I was really lucky in that sense and, and met some just really amazing people at Ames who were very supportive and, 
and encouraging and stuff. So that was that was another instance where an opportunity came up and I was like, wow, that sounds interesting and I'll learn a lot. So, okay. And really got into it. So, but That's yeah, great. Best, yeah. I was just going to say the, the, the microbiology and uh, just a little bit of, uh, I know some people maybe that are tuning in maybe might not know um, exactly what microbiology is, astrobiology, which we've kind of discussed already, but I have, there's some good visuals that you gave us to put in this uh, PowerPoint that of uh, what some what it looks like to be a microbiologist and astrobiologist. So if you don't mind uh, just kind of explaining some of those pictures, we would love that. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is work for my PhD in these particular slides. So I went went to France. France did my my master's there, and then ended up um, in England doing my PhD. But I was working on the Chesapeake Bay impact crater. So these are our samples from the crater, and you can see me in the hard hat on the far right there. That's at a, a field station at the Chesapeake Bay where um, I was with the USGS drilling program and um, working with with their microbiology, like in water resources kind of group and we were doing the, the collection of microbial samples from the drill cores. So on the far left is me with one of the, the samples kind of preserved there. So I went to the USGS to kind of pack up the samples and then brought them back to, to England to study in the lab. And okay, so, cool. yeah, a lot of the time, you know, you go to, you go to these amazing places to collect samples, but then you, you bring them back to the lab a lot of the time and, and study them in the lab. We're getting better and better on techniques that we can actually use at, on the site to get information. But, we we still rely a lot on, on lab work and lab work. I always love I always love lab time. Seen. That's for sure. Um, if you yeah. go to the next slide, there's a, a picture of you actually collecting some of the samples. But yeah, I think I would rather be uh, in the field collecting versus in the lab, even though they're both pretty cool. But um, there's a picture of you here. It looks like a desert area. Where is this? So this is the Atacama Desert in Chile, and this was um, doing some kind of shallow subsurface work looking at, at microbes just in the just beneath the surface there because um, the Atacama Desert is one of the, the driest places we know of on Earth and this is a, a test site we use a lot for Mars missions and um, if you look that up you can see like they'll go and test rover instruments and, and things in the Atacama but we yeah. were we were looking that was another case of where we were looking at you know what is that point where an environment becomes uninhabitable for life and that mm -hmm. edge of like where where those microbes can live very cool okay so so many questions are still coming in so i'm gonna pause for a second and get some more in here um now this question is from suthi and it says what is the reason for artificial gravity or what is the reason for the artificial gravity that is not created in the space station and i think what they're asking is why why don't we have artificial gravity on the space station i'm not sure you would want to answer that uh or no um, but I mean, she might be referencing the uh, the zero the zero g flights, where we do kind of parabolic flights and and that sort of thing. And that's um, that, I mean, I've, I've actually been on on a parabolic flight. We might get to that that later. But um, yes. well, uh, we could go uh, to it. We could. I think that's the next slide. So how perfect that she brought that up. We can actually go right to it. I don't yeah. think. If, oh, there we go. <laughs> See, Magic. yeah. So this this is. <laughs> This is me with the, the Europe, European Parabolic Flight Campaign. So this is when I was in, in Strasbourg in France. And this is my, my team of, of fellow researchers and friends. Um, we were invited, we had an experiment on, on the European flight campaign that was uh, looking at sort of microbes in zero gravity. But the thing with the, the zero gravity flights is it's short bursts of kind of simulated like microgravity where you're you're in a plane that's going kind of up and then it turns and it goes dips down and up again. So it's it's sort of like being on a gigantic roller coaster so that when you're on a, on a roller coaster and you get that little kind of thing in your stomach where you're like, mm, like that, oh, like imagine yes. that. Yeah, imagine that lasting for like, you know, minutes rather than just a couple seconds and you're you're falling and kind of floating. But you're, as the plane is sort of doing that parabola, it's almost like you're getting kind of tossed in the air and you're floating along with the plane until you catch up to it again. Um, and that's, I mean, we can do some sort of biology experiments on those flights, but what we were really looking at was uh, instrumentation and trying to figure out how to get a microscope to work in those those zero gravity environments. Because most biology experiments, you need you need more time than that to actually get, you know, to, to observe how something operates in microgravity. But they're excellent for testing, you know, questions in physics and 
just questions in instr instrumentation and how to build stuff that maybe could then be used on the on the space station or or somewhere else where you have you know you, you're in that environment all the time so you can do studies right. that last a year or, or longer but yeah, and that's definitely one i mean one good point of that is for, for for students that are interested in biology and things um so that those experiments on the parabolic flight wouldn't aren't really astrobiology that's more space biology but it's it's a, kind of neat to point out that as a biologist there are a lot of different avenues you can follow at nasa and in space, you know, you have human space flight, which deals a lot with sort of biotechnology and medicine and, and you know, physiology of humans and, and there's space biology, which is more about looking at how life from Earth responds to the space environment. And, you know, we were looking at taking microbes on Earth and bringing them on the parabolic flight to, to look at how they, how Earth-based life responds to space, whereas astrobiology is more about looking at Earth life as a model for how life could exist elsewhere. So, and then there's there's also planetary protection, which um, is very important in, in, in biology at NASA. And that's that's looking at, you know, how to protect environments in space from Earth life. So when we send a, a rover to Mars, making sure the rover is super clean and it's not going to bring any microbes with it that could, you know, damage or, or change the Martian environment. And um, also looking at when we bring samples back to Earth, that they're safe and they're not going to contain anything that, that might be harmful to, to life on Earth or, or, you know, be, you know, affect us in any way. And also to make sure that those things aren't interfering with any of the science you're doing. Like if you're going to Mars, you don't want to look for cells in the soil, but then find cells that you actually brought with you and, and say, oh, there's some, but they're actually not Martian. They're, they're from Earth that you brought with you. So planetary protection deals with all those kind of questions. Yeah, well, it sounds like um, you're kind of promoting all biologists to come and work at NASA, which is exciting because I think mm -hmm. when people think of NASA, they probably that doesn't come to their mind first that, oh, bi yeah. biology, right? So um, yeah. so that's so cool. Yeah, I, I really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I really, 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 really want to show the group um, your parabolic flight. I mean, because I'm so jealous, and it, it, it's you said it's just the fun part of it. So, but I really, since since you mentioned it, let's go ahead and show that if we can roll that clip of you actually uh, doing the fun part of the the parabolic flight. Yeah, this, this this was this is not us doing science. This is when you do a parabolic flight, you're kind of going up and down multiple times, and luckily they gave us one of the pair or a couple of the parabolas to just kind of experience what it was like and let us play around. So this is me and my, my colleague, Tom Gordon, who's now at the, the University of Sydney and <laughs> doing some results for one of the parabolas. And there you can kind of see how long one of the parabolas lasts. So it's actually a pretty short, short period of time. Oh, that I'm just, that's my dream someday. I know some teachers that yeah. have done it and uh, yep, that's on my bucket list for sure. And now I'm even that's, more inspired. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, more questions. Um, here we go. I have a question about, well, this is a good one that might lead into um, what you do besides this microbiology and astrobiology. You actually, they're asking about how did you develop your skills? And I'm kind of going with this one. Medina said this, say, I'm Medina. And my question is, how did you develop your skills? But let's tie that into your next superhero power, I call it a power and a talent, uh, your artist, your, how you're the graphic artist for NASA. So we'll go to that slide. And then if you want to explain how, what you've done for them graphic artist wise. Uh, yeah. So I, I mentioned that my mother is a visual artist. So I grew up painting and, and drawing and, and she does uh, watercolor and sort of abstract ink. And I think from a very early age, I realized I would never be as good as her when those media. So I moved more toward illustration than oil painting, which were things she didn't do. So I didn't have to compare to, <laughs> compare my work to my mom's. Um, but yeah, and I, and I grew up I loving comic books and um, really got into like the X-Men and things. And I think being being gay in small town Iowa, I kind of identified with that and that the team of, of superheroes that were different than, than everyone else and but had their their kind of group of friends and so I think I, I think I, I connected with that a lot and really got into comics and spent a lot of time in my bedroom drawing comics and, and that sort of thing. And 
Yeah, I kind of joke that once I finished my PhD, I went back to being a 14-year-old kid in my bedroom drawing comic books. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, when, when Mary Voitek, yeah, when Mary Wojtek became a program scientist of astrobiology at NASA, there was one point where she was uh, traveling on a research project and stopped and, and stayed with me and um, saw the artwork that I was, you know, I had all over my house and stuff. And here's some other artwork that I kind of do for fun with the oil painting and the illustration. But we kind of, they, we were thinking about doing, Mary and Linda Billings at the, at the astrobiology program were thinking about doing some sort of outreach project that had to do with with art. And um, yeah, they were, they were kind of like, well, you're already here and you've got this skill, let's see what, what happens. And so we, the idea was to do kind of one thing for the 50th anniversary of exobiology at NASA, but it went over really well and people wanted more. So we've kind of been continuing them and focusing on different aspects of astrobiology. I think issue one was sort of the, the origin story of astrobiology at NASA and um, exobiology at NASA. And then uh, issue two focused on missions to Mars. And issue three was missions, the rest of the missions to the inner solar system. And then issue four was outer solar system. Five was looking at kind of um, places on Earth where we do analog studies, um, like the like Atacama that we saw the pictures of or the dry mm -hmm. valleys in Antarctica. And... Issue seven was prebiotic chemistry and the origin of life, which just got translated into Japanese. I'm really excited wow. about that. Wow, awesome. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, it was like one of those life goals that I didn't realize I had until I saw it in Japanese. I was like, wow. That's, that is that's so cool. cool. I actually, yeah, I, actually uh, I told somebody about that. I know that a couple of people from Japan, I'm like, you guys have to tune in. And then that you just said that, they're gonna be blown away if they're tuning <laughs> in anyways. <laughs> <laughs> that's so perfect that's so perfect yeah, yeah i love when things get translated into other languages because i don't know i think it's just the neatest way to to include everyone in your um, yeah. artwork and your graphic design and i was um it's a little sidetrack but i i when i was reading and we are going to share in a moment we're going to share um aaron's work and the links to some of his amazing um graphic artist uh um, nasa stuff and let me tell you it, it, when I read the first one, um, for me, I had a hard time with reading growing up. And as I love biology, but if I would have just read yours, if I would have seen yours, I would have probably been so much more successful. I mean, I feel very successful and blessed right now. But still, um, it's what a, what a great way to share um, science in, in a graphic way. So I, yeah, I think uh, I, go ahead. I think, no, I think, that's, I think that's a really good point because I, th I think... What I love about comics and, and graphic novels and, and that sort of visual art is that you have, you have people who are visual learners, you have people that are able to sort of read text and, and visualize stuff in their mind, but it's, you know, that, that way, you know, in, in, in comic art, you have a way of visually telling a story and a way of telling the story through text that are interlaced. And I think it's really helpful for people that, that might not sort of learn from reading a tra traditional textbook, you know? Right, right, absolutely. A question, another question that came in, uh, this one just says, my question, I'm not sure who it's from, but it says, drawing seems so hard. Um, if you wanna learn to draw, what's a good way to start? Hmm. I mean, I think the most important thing is to kind of shut off that self-critic. Like it shouldn't, it shouldn't be hard, it, like just, draw draw for pure enjoyment and start with that and just you know I, I was one of those people that i would just fill up pages with drawings and even sometimes just put the pencil down and scribble and and see what comes out of it and you know art art's interpretive you know you you if you're trying to you know there, there are things you can study to kind of learn how to communicate with other people but i think you start with drawing for yourself and and drawing for enjoyment and things that you're interested in and just you know, eventually you kind of figure out what's what's the difference between learning and your style and, and what, you know, what looks good to you. And right. people will That's respond great, to that. That's a great answer. Great answer. I mean, um, as long as you're passionate about it, you could try anything, I, I think. That's a really good way to yeah. uh, live by. Um, best piece of advice in your career? Uh, and maybe from a, a mentor? I mean, I think... That's probably, and I don't even know, I, that might even be my, my mother that kind of gave me the advice of, or my grandmother that, you know, 
do what makes you happy, you know, and, and, and focus on that, you know, don't worry about too much. I mean, obviously you have to worry about finances and, and, and things like that, but, but make sure you're happy, make sure you're doing what makes you happy. And that's, if you follow that, you you know, at least, at least you're going to enjoy your life. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great, great piece think, of advice there. Yeah. And I think from, from my, my great aunt, um, my grandmother's sister, who I was very close with, um, also be yourself. And that was, that was a big part of, of growing up gay. And, and she was a, a Catholic nun in, in San Francisco, but she was a mercy nun. So there, she was um, the, the group that's kind of outspoken for, for universal rights for people and that sort of thing. So, and being at Berkeley, my, a lot of what I would do on the weekends, I'd go over to the city in San Francisco and meet up with Aunt Sheila and we'd go and march in a protest or, you know, do things like that. So <laughs> she was a good influence on me. That's awesome. What a, a, it's just such, such a great story to hear that your family's so supportive of you and everything you've done. And it's just, I, I love, I love your story. Um, I'm very we are, because it's not a real story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to go ahead and do, cause we're running short on time and I, I wish I could talk, I could probably talk hours with you. And so we might just have to continue later, but, um, or maybe a second one, a second NASA STEM star with Aaron Grunstall. <laughs> um, I do have a little bit of a, um, a call to action for the students that are watching. Um, so what we hope that you guys are going to do, and this is where we're going to put it in the chat, is we want um, you guys to read one of Aaron's NASA graphic novels. Or um, if you're not wanting, to, not able to do that, you can always color uh, one of his, his color sheets. So he's developed quite a bit of stuff and he you'll see him all over um, our astrobiology um, website. And then I put the link in. I think that uh, Taisha will put the link in for you. Um, and we would love for you to make your own graphic novel um, and even share it with us. So like Aaron said, uh, if you just got to be okay with, with what you create. And we would love, love, love to see your work, whether it's the color sheet or an actual graphic novel and share it with hashtag next gen STEM. So you can see that right there. And then of course we want you to tune in next week because we have um, an engineer. Her name is Samantha Testa and she works with the SLS or Space Launch System, Egress System. And you'll want to hear from her. She's got a lot of great things to tell you guys. So we're going to wrap up the end, but I want to leave uh, the last thoughts with, with of Aaron with you guys. And so Aaron's going to kind of, we have a quote that we actually, he, he picked, he selected. So I would love for you to, to talk about this and then maybe give some words of advice and uh, and what how this means stuff to you how does it mean what does it mean um and when then we'll kind of close out so go ahead Aaron. oh so that, that that's a, a one of my favorite favorite quotes and um that we need in every community a, a group of angelic troublemakers and it's uh, bayard rustin and he was a, a a colleague of martin luther king jr um very, very important person in the civil rights movement. Um, one of the main organizers of the March on Washington. And uh, he actually kind of spoke later. I mean, he, he was openly gay, um, but not sort of not by choice. He was outed and he was outed in an, sort of an attempt to, to uh, deal you know, to delegitimize what he was trying to do. Um, but then he became a voice for the LGBTQ plus community and, and, and sort of spoke to that. And I, and I just love the idea that, you know, you need to be yourself, you need to, to, to speak up for what is right. Um, and it's important, it's important to, to, to speak your truth to those around you, but also, and probably what I learned from my great aunt as well, um, do that with kindness and, and, and love and, and people around will respond to that. And yeah, I just think, I think he was, he's, he's an amazing person and a quote that always kind of sticks with me. That's uh, awesome, Aaron. I, I've learned so much from you and I know that our listeners have also taken a lot from you and you sharing your story. And I, I'm always, um, I, I would love to have you back at some other time <laughs> because your story is just amazing. And um, we wanna say bye to everyone out there. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, we'll see you guys on the next NASA STEM Stars. Yeah, and happy Pride. <laughs>
Thanks for coming. Bye.